Good evening. Welcome to the University Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible study for April 13th, 2022. I'm Terrence McLean, the ministering evangelist. On behalf of my beloved wife, Linda, on behalf of the elders and their families, the deacons and their families, and all of the wonderful members of the University Church of Christ, uh, we are thankful to God Almighty for blessing us to be able to come together and to study from God's holy and divine word. Uh, we are thankful for all of the members of the University Church who have joined in to study God's word. We are thankful for those from sister congregations who have joined in to study with us from God's holy and divine word. And we are thankful for those who are in search of salvation, a better understanding of God's word and God's will and God's way. Our prayer is that you will indeed be blessed by our time together on this evening. Uh, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And we, the University Church of Christ, are a New Testament church seeking to evangelize, starting with the central core of Greater Cleveland. We will use our unique gifts and opportunities to engage with the community to bring souls to Jesus develop and equip them for a 21st century ministry. That is our mission and vision statement as the University Church of Christ. That's who we are. That is indeed why we exist. In order that we might bring souls to Jesus, glorify God in the process, and build up the body of Christ. There are a few announcements that I'd like to make before we go into our Bible study on this evening. Uh, for University Church of Christ members, the clothing giveaway will take place again on this coming Sunday, April 17, 2022. Uh, the clothes have been donated by the family of Sister Gail Evans, uh, stopped by Room 101 following service, and the ladies within the clothing ministry will be there to assist you. Uh, our food giveaway will be on next Tuesday, April 19th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And we, of course, are inviting the community to come out and to share the foodstuffs that are prepared. We are praying for traveling grace for sisters Charmaine Barnes, Carmen Guest, and Latrice Shields. Uh, also, we are praying for Sister Regina Williams. One of her sons passed away on this past Friday. Uh, we want to pray for her and her entire family in their time of bereavement. Others who are still mourning the loss of loved ones, Sister Michelle Dunlap, the former Sister Michelle Merriweather, uh, and her husband, Brother Eddie Dunlap, minister at the McGuffey Road Church of Christ there in Youngstown. Uh, Sister Michelle, of course, recently uh, buried her father who passed away. Uh, we want to continue to pray for them. We want to continue to pray for Sister Betty Harden, her daughter, uh, Missy, as we know her, and her son, David, as well as the Martin, uh, Iverson, and the Draper and extended family. Uh, Brother Donald Nelson and his family in the passing of uh, his niece out in California. Uh, Sister McLean and myself and my family in the passing of our niece, Sharon Muhammad. Uh, and we did her funeral last Thursday up in Michigan. Uh, we want to continue to remember the Lawton, Dr. Eugene Lawton's family there in Newark, New Jersey, as well as the Newark Church of Christ, uh, the Wright family, Brother Ken Wright, and of course his parents, Nathaniel Wright Sr. and Marva, uh, as well as his brother, Nathaniel Wright Jr. and all of his extended family. Uh, we want to remember the Murphys as they continue to grieve the loss of their brother Joseph. Uh, of course, we want to remember Sister Cornelia Swing's family uh, as well as her daughter, uh, as well as the rest of the extended family continues to grieve her passing. Uh, brother Sanford Davis is at Shaker Gardens Nursing Rehabilitation Center, room 259, bed B. 
and he can receive visitors up until 11 o'clock p.m. So let's continue to remember him in prayer. Uh, pray for continued healing of Sister Barron's father, Sister Constance Barron, uh, Brother Amos Perry, who has been discharged from the hospital. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Sister Pam Ely, specifically for her sight and for her family members in the military. Uh, pray for her brother, Johnny Davis, who has had complications as far as his surgery is concerned. Uh, we want to continue to pray for the health of Sister Mildred Brown, Sister Latrice Shields, uh, Brother Bruce Johnson, Sister Linda Knight, Brother Kevin Edmondson, Brother Melvin Flowers, Sister Sharon Foster, Sister Cherie Warner, Sister Patricia Gaines, Sister Ann McShane, Sister Emma Brown and her grandson Douglas Brown and Sister Emma Brown's entire family. Uh, we also want to continue to pray for Sister Keelan Brewer and her son Cameron, as well as the rest of the family as they continue to grieve the passing of her, her beloved husband, Eric, and their father. Uh, we ask God to continue to comfort them. Uh, we pray for Sister Dora Smith, uh, her continued battle with health issues. We are glad she has returned home safely to us. Pray for Sister Nicole Bird and family, Sister Sabrina Evans and family, uh, for the Betts family uh, and Jessica and Timothy as requested by Sister Sabrina Evans. Uh, pray for a new home for Sister Cherie Warner. And we wanna pray for all of those who've requested prayer for their health and medical procedures. Uh, pray for all of our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters, their families, and those administering to the health and care of our loved ones. Uh, we also want to pray for our leadership at university uh, myself as the ministering evangelist and my beloved wife, Linda, uh, of course, continue to remember Sister Linda uh, McLean as she continues to recuperate from uh, her shoulder surgery. Uh, she is healing day by day, little by little, uh, continue to lift her before the throne of grace uh, so that God will continue to watch over, protect, and keep her. Uh, she has a number of other health issues she is dealing with, but she is doing good. And we are just thankful to God for his, his healing power, for his grace and his mercy and ask him to continue that. Uh, pray for our elders and uh, their family, uh, their, their wives, their children, their extended families, Brother Frank Barnes, Brother Donald Nelson, Brother Greg Shields, our deacons, uh, their wives and their children and their extended families, Brother Freddie Gibson and Brother Anthony Slade. Uh, and also, we not only want to pray for our leadership, but the membership uh, of the University Church of Christ family. I know there are a lot of you who are still going through some trying times. And, and our prayer every day is that God's grace will sustain you. And, and see you through. And always remember that when you open your eyes in the morning, that means that God's new mercies have been given to you. And we ask him to continue to guide, protect, and keep you uh, to not only bless the members of the University Church of Christ, uh, but also to bless uh, the congregations of the Churches of Christ in the greater Cleveland area. Uh, we ask God to bless uh, the memberships, uh, the ministers, and, and the leaderships of the respective congregations, uh, as well as those who are being touched by their ministries. Uh, and of course, not only in Greater Cleveland, but Northeast Ohio, in the state of Ohio, in the country of the United States of America, and around the world. But those are our announcements for this evening. And our prayer is that, especially the University Church of Christ family, will keep those things in mind. They were not in the announcements, but if you are a member of University Church, you can, of course, uh, you are more than invited. We hope that you will definitely join us for our Sunday morning Bible study on Thursday night uh, via Zoom, and you can call the church building and you can get the, the codes, the ID numbers, passwords, uh, either for the phone or for your computer and join us tomorrow night for lesson uh, from the book of Timothy. But now I want you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, verse four through 13. And 
while you're doing that, let's go to God in, in prayer. Otherwise, you know, merciful Father who art in heaven, you are holy and righteous and just, and we are just so thankful for, for all that you've done for us, mm -hmm. all that you continue to do for us. And Father, we realize that we are able to come boldly before your throne of grace because of Jesus, your son, our savior and our Lord. You've heard the, the numerous prayer requests that have been extended, I've told you about all of those. Uh, we have many who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We ask you to please touch us and comfort us and guide us. Uh, there are many who are are sick, who have had surgeries or are anticipating surgeries or have family members who've had hospitalizations or medical issues, would you please, oh Lord, grant us an answer to those prayers as well. Uh, we pray for those who are traveling, that you would give them traveling grace, in particular, Sister Charmaine Barnes, Sister Carmen Guest, and Sister Latrice Shields, uh, watch over, protect, and keep them safe, bring them back safely. Uh, Sister Charmaine and Sister Latrice are the wives of two of our elders, and Carmen, of course, is the daughter uh, of an elder's wife, as well as the sister of an elder's wife, and we just ask you to guide, protect, and, and keep them all, uh, bring them back safely, and others who may be traveling. Uh, Father, our prayers that you'd be with Sister Cherie Warner, uh, we know she's included in those that we pray for uh, that are battling health issues, uh, but we also know that she is uh, trying to, to find a new place of residence uh, where she can feel safe. And so we just ask you, oh God, to be with her in that search, that you would open up doors right now that she thinks may be closed. Uh, we just pray that she will listen for your voice and look at circumstances to determine how and where you are, are leading her. Continue to be with her son, Patrick, uh, as well as her daughter, Brianna, and her grandchildren uh, as well. Again, we ask you to please be with us as we study your word. Not only this study, but we pray for all of the Bible studies that were had uh, on this evening uh, in the greater Cleveland area, or maybe even some other night. And uh, this week for those who had Bible study in greater Cleveland area, Northeast Ohio, the state of Ohio, this country of the United States where we are blessed to live, as well as congregations of your people around the world. Uh, we pray, oh God, that all of us who have taught and will be teaching, that we will rightly divide the word of, of truth. We'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, uh, and the praise. Father, just be with me as I speak your word. May I give you glory. May Jesus be lifted up. May saints be encouraged and built up in the most holy and precious faith. And Father, especially may someone who's not yet obeyed the gospel hear truth and respond in humble obedience before it's everlasting and eternally too late. It's in Jesus' mighty name. We pray and ask it all. Amen. Tonight, we want to study from Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. Can one have hope without God? Can one have hope without God? I think all of us would be uh, in agreement that what the world needs right now is some hope. And we certainly cannot find hope in the world's systems and in the world's governments, uh, that there must come, that hope must come from a, a heavenly source, someone greater than ourselves. So let's talk about, can one have hope without God? And, and this is how Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13 reads, and if you are watching this live on Facebook, and I'm hoping it's coming across live on Facebook, uh, I have endeavored to put this all together and get us hooked up 
uh, on my own without uh, the expertise of probably one of the greatest brothers uh, I've ever met in, in the body of Christ, Brother Rick Winston. And I, I'm hoping that his teaching and training and modeling for me is paying off tonight. Uh, but we're thankful for him and for Kevin and for Brother Freddie Gibson, as well as Brother Ray Knight. Um, and by the way, we do want to pray for, for Brother Ray. He was not on the list, um, but we know that he, he had somewhat of a scare. Uh, so we want to continue to pray for him. But I thank all those brethren for what they do to help us stay connected to you and to the world. But Romans 15, 4 says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Verse 8 says, And now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again, he said, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Verse 11 says, and again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah said, Isaiah, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. And the key verse from our text on tonight's study. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to read verse 13 again. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost ghost. Can one have hope without God? Edward Young once said this in Night Thoughts, thou my all, my theme, my inspiration, and my crown, my strength in age, my rise in low estate, my soul's ambition, pleasure, wealth, my world, my light in darkness, and my life in death, my boast through time, Bliss through eternity. Eternity, too short to speak thy praise or fathom thy profound of love to man. Wow. The psalmist said in Psalm 42 and verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. 
Hope you don't mind me reading that verse again, Psalm 42 and verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his continence. Can one have hope without God? The question is this, what is hope? Hope is defined by some as a desire for future good. Its object as that of faith is something that is unseen. It differs from mere expectation because the latter, talking about expectation, is based on natural processes and refers to either good or evil things and lacks the element of, of desire. But the word hope in Greek from which we get the New Testament, elpis never occurs in the gospels. The word that is in the gospels is elpizo, and it occurs only, only five times. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 21, it's, it's there. Matthew chapter 12. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. That word trust comes from that verb el pizzo. In Luke chapter 6, verse 34, Luke chapter 6, verse 34, and if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. That word hope again from El Pizzo. And again, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 8, and Luke chapter 24 and verse 21, and then in the Gospel of John chapter 5, verse number 45. So the question is, why is there so little teaching on hope in the Gospels? See if I can answer that for you. The religion of the Old Testament, Judaism, to which Christ and his apostles related themselves, was essentially one of hope, of joyful desire or anticipation. Jesus' teaching while he walked this earth was meant to deepen that hope. But that hope, such as it was, was small when compared with the better hope. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 19, which rested on the unchangeable kingly priesthood of, of Christ. We have a better hope. And Hebrews goes on and tells us why it is a better hope, a lot of it hinging on his resurrection from the dead. We're going to get into that shortly. Um, but while Jesus walked this earth, the, the hope that was mentioned was simply this Old Testament concept uh, of the coming Messiah. The disciples knew that in Christ was realized the hope of Israel, as did Simeon in Luke chapter 2. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse number 29. Luke chapter 2, verse 29. And this is what Simeon, the priest in the temple, says. Lord, now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. 
For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. So they knew somewhat of this realization of the hope. But remember, the Gentiles have yet to be brought in. So Jesus, in training his disciples in faith, Mark 11, verse 22, and then, of course, the passage of Scripture we're all familiar with, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In training his disciples in faith and in the preeminence of, of love, Matthew 22 and verse 14, he remained silent in regard to hope. He, he presented himself as the realization of their hope. He was a present possession for them. Now, he did teach them of his future coming back in glory in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 25. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. But nevertheless, he never wanted to divert their attention from himself as the center and focus of all their future hopes. So that's why Paul speaks uh, of Christ to you and I in the words that he wrote to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. I want that to sink in. For those of us who live under the new covenant, under what we call New Testament Christianity, Christ is our hope. This is why he or she who has Christ in him or her immediately acquires hope of a better world and a far greater bliss than the one experienced in the here and now. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter eight, verse 15. Romans chapter eight, verse 15. Watch this. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, 
even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now watch this, verse 24. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Why? Because we have hope. This is why the Lord Jesus did not invite people to acquire the hope of heaven. But he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me. You see, we have a whole lot of people in the religious world who have a hope in religion. But Jesus doesn't tell you to get religion. He said, come to me. He didn't say get some kind of faith. He said, come to me, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you new rest. You see, our hope is in a relationship with him. So hope is a, a psychological necessity. Even the expectation of fruition is called hope in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Look there, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 and 11. I want to read both of those verses. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 10 and 11. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. And he, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? You see, the hope of reward sweetens labor. And such expectation is called hope because it is based on the knowledge of past history. Listen, the ancient world, as is observed through representation on marble and through writings we have found, had a mere illusionary hope of the future world after death. They didn't have a full concept of what life after death or a world after death would be. The hope of pagans was far different than the hope that we as Christians have. Paul tells us that real Christian hope is not possible without God manifested in Christ. This is why Jesus is so important. And our relationship is with him. In Ephesians 2, verse 12 and 13, Paul wrote this. In, in talking to the Ephesian Christians who were Gentile, he says to them, as a matter of fact, beginning at verse 11 of Ephesians 2, wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Look at this next phrase, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, 
Oh, that's your shouting phrase right there if you're a child of God. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of, of Christ. See, that's why Paul went on and wrote to the Thessalonians who were, were somewhat concerned about their loved ones who had died in Christ. What was going to happen to them if Jesus comes back and they've died and been buried and we're alive? Paul said, what are you worried about? Verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Paul said to them, listen, your loved ones died in the Lord. They have hope and you have hope. Those who die outside of Christ don't have hope. Without God, there is no hope. And it is only through faith in Christ that we become children of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and, and 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, what's even more important, let me, let me back up a little bit. It says in verse number 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Again, Galatians 3, verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law, watch this. If there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Talking about that Old Testament law, that Levitical law, that Mosaic law. Verse 22 says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Verse 23 says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterward be revealed. Verse 24, for wherefore the law was our, our schoolmaster, it was our tutor. The schoolmaster or the tutor in that day and age was the slave that went to the home and escorted the children from the home to the place of instruction. And they stayed there while the child was being instructed. And then they escorted the child back home again. So he says that the law was not our final tutor or our schoolmaster. It was a schoolmaster, but it brought us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, that word in, I in comes from a Greek word in, epsilon nu, that's in what is called the locative, and it means that we are all the children of God faith, by faith within the sphere of Christ Jesus. And then he tells them in verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's how they got into Christ. Thank you, man. So without God, there is no hope. And it's only through faith in Christ that we become children of God. So getting back to Romans chapter, chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 speaks of God as the God of hope. Now in the Greek language, there is a definite article before hope. So it literally says it, it is now the God of the hope. And what Paul wants them to understand is that 
the hope that God gives, the hope that Yahweh gives, Jehovah in our English version, is not the illusionary pagan or psychologically necessary attitude of expectation. It is the hope based on Jesus Christ and his resurrection as a historical fact. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this, there are some people who are going to go to church service this coming Sunday, and they call it Easter Sunday. You know, there are some folk who, who only go to church on Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. So this is their time to come. They're going to celebrate the resurrection. But in the New Testament, the church celebrated the resurrection every first day of the week. Not only did we celebrate, do we celebrate the resurrection every first day of the week, we also celebrate the death and suffering of Jesus till he comes through the Lord's Supper or communion every first day of the week because that's what the first century church did according to Acts 20 and verse 7. But our hope is based on Jesus raising, rising from, from the dead. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Some translations say a living hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he says in verse 21 of that chapter, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith, and here's that word again, and hope might be in God. Because Jesus got up from the dead, we have hope. Our faith and our hope are the result of Christ's resurrection. Folks, if Jesus didn't get up from the dead, everything that we do in the church is meaningless. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 through 15, watch this. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, I'll say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Anyone who bases his or her life on illusionary faith and hope is to be pitied. Mm -hmm. Roman numeral three says, says this, the giver of dependable hope is God. The God of hope does not mean the God who needs or is characterized by hope for himself. God does not hope for anything as we do. He is sovereign and not circumscribed by time. The word expressed rather that it is God, and that should be a capital G. Uh, I type this up, so any mistakes in it are, are my responsibility. But the word expressed rather that it is God, and that should be a capital G, who dispenses hope. We can never have any worthwhile hope on our own or on the assurance of any human being or circumstances. Don't you realize that every four years we go to the polls and we vote for a, a new president? And everybody always goes to the polls and they think that if we get a new one, doesn't matter what the old one has done, if we get a new one, things are going to get better. And it doesn't often get better. Sometimes it gets worse. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
any worthwhile hope on our own or the assurance of any human being or circumstances will not last. Hope without the possession of God is impossible and the saving knowledge of God can be only through Jesus Christ. And I know I sound like a broken record. But it was Jesus who said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life, and that no man comes under the Father but by me. Jesus also said in John chapter 10 in verse number 30, I and my Father are one. In John 10, 37, he says, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. He said in 1038, but if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse number 45, Jesus said, and he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. In the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, verse 7 through 10, if you had known me, you should have known my father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. John chapter 16, verse 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Hope without the possession of God is impossible. And the saving knowledge of God can be only through Jesus Christ. He undergirded our hope through his resurrection. And if anyone's life is without real hope, it is because he or she has not come to know the God of hope through Jesus Christ, his son. The same type of expression is in Romans chapter 15 and verse number five. Now the God of patience and consolation, it means not the God who's need of patience and consolation, but the God who dispenses patience and consolation, these gifts to us. The hope of God fills us with joy and peace. That's what Romans 15 and verse 13 says. With joy and, and peace. In this crazy mixed up world, don't you want some peace? Don't you want some joy? Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Fill you with joy and peace. That word feel, that English word feel, F-I-L-L, -L, comes from a Greek word. And it's the aorist active optative tense. And what it means is, may the God of hope feel you. It indicates that God himself, in a successive repetitive manner, feels the Christian. Don't you know every day you and I wake up and we see God's sunshine? Every day we wake up and we're able to breathe and to move and to think and to act, that God 
is again and again filling us with hope. It's like a resurrection. We, we, we lay down and we go to sleep and, and we don't know what's going on while we're sleeping. But then God decides to stop by and fill us with another day of mercy and hope. As we believe God, as we trust him, as we obey him, there is born in us the hope of the realization of all that we ever hope to receive in and through Christ in this life and the one to come. We've already read one passage of scripture says that we are joint heirs with Christ. Now, doesn't that kind of excite you? That for the child of God, we are joint heirs with Christ. So that means whatever God the Father gives to God the Son for eternity, he's going to give to you and I if we remain faithful unto death. He keeps on filling us with hope. What does he give us? He gives us salvation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation. He gives us eternal life. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. In hope of, and as a matter of fact, let me start at verse one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. The hope of eternal life. Titus 3, verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We get the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verse number 2. As a matter of fact, let's start at verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of god we read about it again in colossians 1 and verse 27 we have the hope of the resurrection of the dead in Acts chapter 24, verse 15, and Acts chapter 23 and verse 6. In Jesus Christ is summed up all that anybody in this life needs and anything that anybody in the next life needs. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1, that he is our hope. We fix our eyes on the heavens for our hope is there. We are ever looking for that blessed hope, Titus 2 and verse 13. Hope is not static. God fills us and it's spilled over from us to others. But as we share our hope, our measure of it never diminishes. Oh, that's, that's really what evangelism is all about. That you and I go out to the world. We have the privilege of saying to the rest of the world when we see people who's Continents has fallen, or maybe they have tears drowning, coming out of their eyes, going down their cheeks. Maybe their backs are bent over and their heads are bowed and, and they seem confused and they have nowhere else to go. Listen, you and I can give them the hope that we have and we won't have any less hope after sharing our hope with them than we had before we shared it with them because God gives us so much hope over and over and over again. It's not a tap that constantly runs, but it's one that God activates so that we experience his feeling us 
every day of our lives. He fills us with all joy and peace. That adjective, pasa, means all kara or joy as well as all peace. It means that he fills us with every kind of joy and every kind of peace and all that can be had by anyone. As Christians, the believer who hopes misses nothing of joy and peace. Listen, joy is a virtue and not simply an emotion. It's grounded upon God himself. And folk, the older I get, the more I realize what God really wants us to desire is not things from him. He wants us to desire him. See, a lot of folks are chasing after the things that God could give them. But sometimes God might decide to take it away from you. But as long as you got him, everything's going to be all right. Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11 puts it this way. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That means that no matter what the circumstances I have going on in my life and around me, and one thing I want to remind you of Romans chapter 8, verse 28 said, we know that God is always working for us. He is working for our good. No matter what the circumstances are, God will turn it around and make it work for our good, even when it's bad. Doesn't say everything that happens to us is going to be good, but if you trust him, if you have hope in God, he will turn it around and make it work for your good and my good. So he said, Paul did in Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Joy characterizes the Christian's life on earth, 1 Peter 1, verse 8. And it also anticipates the joy of being with Christ forever in heaven. There is a study in theology called eschatology, which means the study of the end times. Don't you know the only end time that really matters is standing before God and hearing him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on up a little higher and I'll make you ruler over many. You see, joy has nothing to do with our circumstances. As a matter of fact, joy is really paradoxical because joy can be the outcome of suffering and sorrow for Christ's sake. Colossians 1.24, 2 Corinthians 6.10, 1 Peter 4.13, and Hebrews 10.34. And then being a gift of the Holy Spirit, it's something that we receive, this joy, this peace, it's dynamic. It's not static. Peace here means peace toward God as a result of the removal of our sin. That's what Romans 5.1 is really all, all about. Being then made free from sin, we have peace with God. You see, there are too many who are even listening to this lesson who are trying to have the peace of God without having peace with God. You'll never get the peace that passes all understanding until you have peace with God. That means your sins are forgiven and washed away. P 
peace toward God, a result of the removal of our sin, and then we can have that inward tranquility or peace, Philippians 4, 7, and it won't ever be hindered by the world's strife. Preacher, don't you know what's going on in the world? Yes. Don't you know about Ukraine? Yeah, I know. Don't you know about how ga high gas prices? Yeah, I know. Don't you know about the shortages? Yeah, I know. Don't you know that COVID's still with us? Yeah, I know. But guess what? Even in the midst of all of this, I can have peace. And it's not because my head is in the sand. It's because even though I don't know much what tomorrow holds, I know the one who holds tomorrow in his hand. So the means of appropriating this hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 13. You notice what he says? in believing. The Greek is literally in the believing. And in is in that first phrase. Then the second phrase is literally in the hope. And then the third phrase is literally through the power of the Holy Ghost. And so he says in all three phrases here, in, I in means in connection with in connection with your continuing to believe, in connection with your continuing to have hope, in connection with the power of the Holy Spirit, you will have this peace and joy. The verb believing is translated from a Greek word that means in the active process of your constant believing, there will be a repeated filling of your life cup with joy and peace. See, that's what Hebrews 11, 6 means when it says without faith. It is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is the condition of the feeling, but it also must be in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the purpose of this constant believing that ye may, may abound. Mm -hmm. That you may have more than enough for yourself. The idea is that the God of hope is not going to give us all the joy and peace that we need for ourselves only, but an extra measure for others. Mm -hmm. The Christian who constantly trusts believes slash obeys, the God of hope will have joy and peace to spare. Joy and peace to spare. Paul said it this way in Philippians 4.12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But he said, I'm not worried about it. Because verse 7 of Colossians 2 says this, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. There's that word. Constant believing so we can share with others. This abounding is achieved by means of the hope with which God fills us. The God of hope does not merely fill us with all joy and peace as we trust him, but purposely infills us with these abounding gifts so that we may share them. Under the abounding and the exercise of this hope by means of the power of the Holy Spirit. Since Christ in us is our hope of glory, Colossians 1.27, it is Christ who must abound. Under the abounding of the Christ in us so that he may become the possession of others also. Christ must not only fill us with all joy and peace, but he must spill over from us to others. For this, the same hope that we appropriated by faith and obedience to abound also to others, 
it must also be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our shared joy and peace can become Christ, the hope of glory in others, resulting in God's joy and peace only through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is the conclusion for this night's lesson or whenever you happen to be watching this? Mm -hmm. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our hope today. It is our assurance that we have a living savior to help us live as we should now. And that when in the end we set forth on that last great journey, we shall not travel an uncharted course, but rather we shall go on a planned voyage, life to death, to eternal living. That's what Raymond McKendry wrote in Queen's Gardens. It reminds me of what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 12. Laying aside every weight in the sin that does so easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the pioneer and the completer of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. No affliction, nor temptation, no guilt, nor power of sin, no wounded spirit, nor terrified conscience should induce us to despair of help and comfort from God. Let me close with John 10, verse 14 through 16. John 10, verse 14 through 16. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. We've already seen in Galatians as well as in Ephesians that those other sheep were the Gentiles, which is what you and I are, who are not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as far as our race ethnicity is concerned. But notice Jesus said, we would hear his voice and that there would be one fold there would be one shepherd. Jesus is the chief shepherd. Tonight, I invite you, if you've not yet listened to that voice, that voice tells you that you need to hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe I am he, you shall die in your sins, and where I am, you cannot come. You need to hear, you need to believe. You need to repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You need to confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's son. And then you need to be buried, baptized in water for the remission of sins. And you can arise and walk in the newness of life. And then it will be Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you need to obey the gospel of Christ? Then you can see if you have any questions or need prayer, you can call the church office as showing on this slide, 216-421-0233, or you can go to our website, www.univ1885coc.org slash prayer. We'll answer your questions or we'll pray for you, pray with you. If you need to be restored, you need to call us so that you can once again walk hand in hand with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me in our study tonight. And for all of you who are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. Whether you're a Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. Pray with me. Father God, we realize that we cannot have hope without you. We thank you for Jesus, your son. 
You so love the world that you gave your only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many of us have obeyed your gospel because we believe in Jesus. But there are many others who have yet to respond in humble obedience to the gospel of Christ. Father, my prayer is that this message and any others they see on the Facebook page or on our YouTube channel for the University Church of Christ will touch the hearts of those who need salvation and that they will respond in humble obedience before it's everlasting and eternally too late. I pray for lost souls everywhere. Touch the hearts. Open up their understanding. Holy Spirit, convict them through the word. Remind them of the love of God for them. And may they obey the gospel before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Be with your children who need to be restored in their walk with you. Draw them by your word, by this message and many others. Draw them by our love that we demonstrate for them and to them. And for all of us who are your children, forgive us of our sins in word or thought or deed. We're so thankful your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Watch over us as we leave this platform, whether they're watching live on Facebook or they're on the teleconference call or they're watching later on Facebook or on YouTube. Help us to be mindful we're never out of your presence. Thank you for grace and mercy.